Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome back to the Shari Tshuva Chavora. Guys, if you could just mute yourself a little bit. Oh, you got the book. Great. Just make sure everyone's on mute. Good. Okay, so those who don't have the Safer, I do always recommend getting one. Uh, in the Rafua Shalema, right? In the um, continued health, good health, for Rabbi Pinto, Rav Pinto. His Hebrew name is Yoshiyahu Yosef ben Zachri, and a dear family friend, Yonatan Yechesko ben Iris, that Betok Shar Chol Yisrael, they should all have a quick and consistent health, right? Rafu Shalema. We are in Shar Aleph, true, it's, we're almost at the end. I think next time we meet will be the end. Now, we're not meeting next Sunday, so... As I was mentioning, we are in paragraph 49. I think that's all we're going to cover today. So towards the end, there's only two more paragraphs left till the end of Shar Aleph. So we're not meeting next week, because next week for us in Jerusalem is still Purim. So, Afraid of Purim to everybody, and uh, we'll meet in two weeks' time. And Bezrat Hashem will be able to finish Shar Aleph, Shar Rishon. In the meantime, we're on the 19th principle. I just want to remind everybody that there are really three main principles in tshuva, but the um, Rabbeinu Yonah breaks it down to 20, let's say, bite-sized steps in order to help us really accomplish tshuva. And this is, right, just before the end, this is like almost the crux of the matter, right? We're getting like a crescendo. You know, there's like a beautiful orchestra, and we're seeing all the different instruments, and we're feeling the, the vibe, you know? So, Bezrat Hashem, I will be sharing a story. I want you to hang in there, and if you don't, if you, you want to go fast forward, fast forward to the end, <laughs> I, you know, I get you. So, if, if you ever heard of the Benish Chai, Rav Yosef Chaim of Baghdad, right? He, he died about 100 years ago. He lived over 150 years ago, and he was one of the greatest Kabbalists. He lived in Iraq, in Baghdad, and he was one of the greatest Kabbalists that ever lived. Here's a picture, if you're familiar with this particular picture. This is the standard picture. I don't know if it's a real picture. I imagine it was, right? They had uh, pictures. He died in 1909, right? He, he, he was born in 1835. I don't know if they had cameras back then in Baghdad, but there's anyway, it wasn't as a newborn. He's definitely an adult. Okay, so um, he writes on the Agadatas, not only, you know, but that was one of the main ideas in the Gomorrah, in the Talmud, that he brings down. It's very mystical. Now, what he's going to speak about is more of a story. And I'm not a great storyteller, but I found this story absolutely fascinating, and I said, I have to share it. Now, it is a little bit, as we say, I mean, I say, um, it was BYS. But it can't be. It can't be BYS, because... It's the Benish Chai is telling us in this holy safer of his. So what's BYS? Be below yeshiva standards. It's not at all. It can't be. But if you know what it means, what I'm trying to refer to, it's called adult talk. Okay. So we're all adults, right? I even label none of my videos are for kids, even though kids could watch them. Um, but it's not for children um, per se, because I don't want to get in any trouble with YouTube in case we say something that and get a strike against us. So keep this in mind. It's for uh, a mature audience only. Uh, the story that is. Let's begin. So for those who have the safer that we're using, we're on page 115. It's the 19th principle. Hatisha Aser, right? The 19th principle is like this. Azivet Cheto. It's somebody, right? They, they um, abandon their sin, okay? But what happens? His domain vehu betoykev tavato. But he's confronted once again, even though he abandoned his sin. She, he, they abandoned their sin, and yet the desire is still intense to commit the sin again. So there's a famous Gemara in Yuma, 86b. It describes what. It's really a question. How do you know you're a Baal Tshuva, right? A Baal Tshuva, Baal means master. The truth is, it also means husband, right? The husband you call Mr., right? Probably Mr. came from Master. 
But anyway, so the Gemara says like this. With regard to repentance, the Gemara asks, what are the circumstances that demonstrate that one has completely repented? In other words, if they went through all these steps, whether it was just the three, the three major categories we spoke about, right? Charata, sort of regret, right? A vidoy, a confession, and a zivatachet, of committing never to do it again. Or the 19 steps we went through so far, including tonight, the 20 steps altogether. I really went through them all. I think I did. How do I know I really did? How am I sure? How am I absolutely 100% sure? And that's going to be the story of the Ben Ishkai. Okay, but one second. Let's start with the Gemara. So Rav Yehuda said, for example, a prohibited matter came to his hand a first time, and then a second time, and he was saved from it, thereby proving that he's completely repented. Okay, it's a little bit vague, but we get the idea. Now, number three, num the second thing is Rav Yehuda actually demonstrated. So it's the same Rav Yehuda who said, it came to you a first time, and then a second time, and you were saved from it. You didn't commit it again. He demonstrated. It's going to be very important. The word, we'll see it in Hebrew also, demonstrated what he meant. Now, what does it mean he demonstrated? <laughs> so that's where the Ben Ishkai explains what exactly is this demonstration. If he has the opportunity to sin with the same woman he sinned with previously. Now just use your imagination. It doesn't have to be this particular sin. It doesn't have to be a man with a woman. It could be a woman with a man. It could be a kleptomaniac, right? It could be a bank robber. It could be any sin, right? <coughs> Pepperoni pizza. Whatever it is. He had the... Uh, he, if one has, an has the opportunity to sin with the same woman he sinned with previously at the same time in the same place, so basically, he does list, the Gemara lists three things. Same woman, same time, same place. But really what it means was everything was aligned as it was the first time. When the person sinned, but this time he overcomes his inclination. This is the proof that his repentance is complete and he is forgiven. I mean, that's an amazing statement. How often does that even happen? Now, I want to tell you, there is an opinion... <laughs> There is an opinion by the in the clear car, and I've checked it out with Godoli. You know, just make sure that I'm reading this correctly. He definitely seems, from all readings, his claim is that the person is actually putting himself in the same position another time, which is mind-boggling. Because if it was Yichud being alone with a woman, how could you ever do that? However, we will see, there's another Gemara we're going to talk about. Um, and it describes this, what is, who's greater? A Tzadi Gamor, someone who never sinned, or a Baal Tshuva, right? There's a different Gemara altogether. Who's greater? Someone who sinned and then, let's say, achieved this level versus someone who never sinned at all. So from the Gemara itself, it doesn't seem like there's a conclusion. But from all the Meforshim, all the commentators seem to agree that the Baal Tshuva is actually greater. Why? Because he worked on himself, he overcame. Whereas the Tzadik Gamor, the complete right, completely righteous person, never had these desires, never had the inclination, never even fell, right? But who's a real Tzadik? One who falls seven times and gets up. Keep this in mind, because one of the ideas that we have been pondering is when we sin, we get depressed and we get down on ourselves. Well, wait till you hear the story. <laughs> I mean, this guy wants to kill himself. I'm telling you, you can look at it all. But ultimately, he comes out like an angel. Okay? And this is to build your self-esteem after you have sinned. So if the Baal is actually greater than the Tzadik Amor, the actual words are, that a tzaddik gamor cannot stand in the place of a balchuva. What does that mean? How can it mean he can't stand in the place? According to the Kliyakar, it means that he cannot go into that room to be alone with the woman, whereas the balchuva actually can in order to go through these motions of showing that he is completely over this situation. Nobody seems to agree that that's the reality, but nevertheless, that is a thought within the Kliyakar, and we're going to really go into these ideas deeply here. 
So let me just read some of the Hebrew of what we're talking about in Yuma 86b. Amru Zichron Levracha. The rabbis have taught us. Ezebal Teshuvah. Who is a master of repentance? Who is a genuine Baal Teshuvah? Asher Teshuvato Megaat At Kisei HaKavod. Now those words do not appear in the Gemara. So the commentator here in this safer thinks that Rabbeinu Yonah put it in. It could be maybe in a measure somewhere, but that's interesting that the tshuva actually reaches the throne of glory, meaning it's completely accepted by God and forgiven. That's for sure what it means. Nivchan v'yotze naki ba'oto perech ba'oto makum ba'oto isha. How does one reach this level? When he's been tested at the same stage of his life. That's important when it comes to sexual matters because apparently the older you get, could be very old, I don't know, uh, some sexual uh, desires are weaned or are weakened. But let's say it was power, right? Maybe the older you get, the more power you want. I mean, I can't imagine, you know, but I do know there are people who are you know, running for president sometime, they're in their 70s, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, maybe power, corru- absolute power corrupts absolutely. So don't think that the that it has to do with age. I, I'm using age because he mentioned at the same, same stage of his life, in the same place with the same woman, meaning the same stamina, the same physical stamina, in order to have this, if we're talking sexually, uh, but anyway, uh, to... So what are we saying? We're saying the same stage of your life, the same place, the same woman uh, who he had sinned originally. And he emerged clean from the test. Great. Ritzon al Namar. What did the sages want to say? What is the Gemara trying to tell us? Ki hisdame liado, that the sin came to his hand, meaning the possibility of transgression, but he overcame it. He conquered it with his, with his good inclination, while his, I'm sorry, while his, while his evil inclination was very strong, but he overpowered it. And it's, this is another example, perhaps, as a, um, symbolizing sexual temptation, but he still had the same strength in the muscles of his abdomen when he original sinned. But he overcame it. The Nimlat Ba'avon. And he, he um, was saved from the sin because of this idea. Ready? Yira Tashem. Because of his healthy awe and fear of God. Big'on Pachdo. Which means um, he, is, he realized how amazing Hashem is, how great uh, Hashem is. So that's why. Not because he was going to fear that he would get caught or lose, you know, get sued in court or anything like that, but strictly because of his awe and fear of God. And that's going to play an important part in where we're going with this. So that's going to be what we're going to call the ultimate level of tshuva. Um, I'm kind of excited about reading this uh, Ben Ishkai, but we're going to have to wait. Based on the above, it would seem that if a person never again confronted the same temptation, an opportunity. So then you would never know. In other words, the Gemara gives you like a clear sign. If you want to know you're about tshuva, you mastered it, so you're going to be in the exact same position, same situation, everything lines up, and you don't do it. Well, what are the chances of that really happening? I mean, everything is picture perfect, right? Exactly. No, I don't know, unless you orchestrate it. We'll see. Wait till you hear what the Benish Kai has to say. But you are in a little bit of a dilemma because we do like to be assured of something. So <coughs> he mentions on already 117, not everyone is placed in that situation. But Rabbeinu Yon is going to give us um, advice. So guess what? Most likely, most likely you will not be in the same exact situation with the same one, with the same desires, and everything the same. So what should you do? Well, his It didn't occur to you. It just didn't happen. So what do you do? How are you going to know that you actually conquered your Yetzirah 100% and your truth is accepted? 
So, Yosef ben Nasho Yus Hashem. You should add into your Nisham, into your soul, into your, into your being, the fear of God. Dover Yom Biyomo. In other words, every single day, increase a little bit. That's the sure way, because who says you're ever going to have that situation fold for you, come out for you? The Kasher Yachlif Koach Hayiras Dai Kavush the Koach Hazet Yitzro. Then, by your increase of fear, you're getting to the point that even Hashem would know, right? That if you were ever confronted with your Yitzhahara, of course, this guy, Hashem, looking from his abode, right? He knows you more than you know yourself. And you're working on your Hashem that he knows, right? And you know as much as you could possibly know that if you ever confronted with it, you for sure would not fall uh, again with it. Umisat mishalo ba'oitzen matava. Meaning that this power, this having all the year, the, the fear and awe, is sufficient for you to be able to control the most intense uh, te temptation that would ever seize you, and it's all in potential because you never got to actualize it. Okay. Halo bochein livos hu yavin v'notzer nafsho hu yodea. So at that point, someone, we're talking about Hashem, He's the one who examines hearts. He'll, will, he'll be the one who understands. And the one who guards your soul, he will know. He will know what? That if you ever do get into such a situation, a test, and the, everything lines up like the first time, then you're certainly going to be able to save yourself because of you know, you overcame your Yetzirah. And Miyad Yitzro. Hine, who lifne Hashem b'madrege el yona minachuma. So, not knowing or not being in that exact situation, this is the best way to assure yourself that you actually, um, your your chuba will be accepted and stands up to, you know, the highest level of doing chuba. There's a very long note. I do believe that it's important to discuss it. Um, let's do it. So earlier on in paragraph 11, Rabbeinu Yonah stated that the second principle of truth is called forsaking sin. In other words, having the conviction not to sin again requires the person to resolve with his entire heart. It has to be like you have to be honest with yourself and you have to know this is it's in your deepest gut that you will never repeat the sin again. Now obviously this means you must make a sincere resolution that you will truly intend to fulfill. I just want to turn this off real quick. because Okay, there's Okay. So in other words, it's between you and God. You know you have such conviction. Of course, it's only the, the, the real test is yet to come, but it may not come. But you know in your heart, you really forsake this sin. So, just forsaking it alone with regret and vidoy, they, it does compromise the elementary uh, stepping stones, as we said, for tshuva. Um, but here, the Rabbeinu Yonah wants to get across is that if one increases his fear of Hashem to the point where Hashem knows that he would not sin again, even in the most compelling circumstances, he has attained the pinnacle of tshuva, the highest possible level. Clearly, this is the greater level than that demanded by the earlier principle of just forsaking the sin. So just forsaking the sin, that's fine, that's nice, but this is beyond. Remember, that's why the Rabbeinu Yonah puts 20 steps. He really wants to break it down to um, you know, bite-sized pieces for us. We thus learn, that although forsaking sin demands sincere resolution to not repeat the sin, the principle does not require that each one reach the level where Hashem knows he would never sin again. Rather, it requires that the person be sincere in his commitment and try their hardest to avoid repeating the sin. If, God forbid, someone ultimately fails, so does that mean your truva wasn't accepted the first time? No, not necessarily. It's all in the heart. If you really sincerely convicted yourself not to do it. And we're talking about real honesty here. 
It's only between you and God. There's nobody else going to, right? It's between you and God. So if you end up falling again, it's a new sin. It's not compounded to say, oh, see, I never really did tshuva the first time. Now, if I sin thinking I'm going to sin and then I'm just going to do tshuva, that doesn't count. That's not going to work. There's a detriment to that concept because that you're not even being honest with yourself. Nor are you being honest with Hashem. So he says, if he ultimately fails, that does not negate the truth he did for the first sin. It only means he's to do truva again and must try even harder this time. But even the failed resolution counts as a resolution. It still, it still meant something, provided it was sincere when he originally took it. Okay, that's all the part I want to read from there. Other, obviously, more important, other important things, but I really want to get to the story of the Ben Ishkai. Uh, King Solomon said in 16.6 of Proverbs. Now, we, we've discussed these verses before, but, and we're drilling them in. With loving kindness and truth, right? In Hebrew, Bechesed ve'emet. Then your sin will be forgiven. But it's the latter part we didn't focus on, on yet. And that is, And with the fear of God, because this is what we're talking about. If you, you don't know if you're ever going to be in that situation where you're going to be exactly in the, you know, with all the uh, variables lining up. So what's your best thing to do is build the Yirat Hashem all the time and the word sur me ra, we usually think it means, and then as a verb, you will turn away from evil. In other words, if you build up your yira, your awe, that will be like the energy that will help you turn away from evil. No, he's going to s- describe the actual awe of Hashem is the removal of the evil. And that removal of evil guarantees you uh, perfect repentance for, for your past deeds. And that's what he wants to prove. So he brings this verse, as I just said, the Chesed VMS, Yechupar Avon, Ubiyas Hashem, Sur Meira. Truth and kindness, to the truth, kindness and truth, sin will be forgiven, and through fear of God, turning from evil. Turning from evil. Perush, what does it mean? Ubiyas Hashem, Lesur Minhara, Im Yizdamein Liyado. The verse means, according to Rabbeinu Yonah, that sin is actually forgiving you through the kindness and the truth, and also through fear of Hashem that is actually powerful enough to make a person turn from evil if it should ever confront you. In other words, the building up the yira is the guarantee that if it ever would, ha- if you ever, if all the, the variables would line up, you're guaranteed you're not going to fall for the sin. And now he proves it. He says the word sur is makur. Now, I don't think it means noun, but it means a root form as opposed to a verb. So he says milat sur makur. So the word sur, which means to turn, is a root form that refers to the concept of turning from evil. So it's a concept. That's why I don't know a better word than a noun, but if you know what a concept is, not a verb that refers to the act of turning from evil. So the verse describes a level of fear of Hashem, which actually the fear itself serves to turn one away from evil. Not the avoidance of evil in practice. We're talking about the concept. The Ya'id al Haperush has that, and as proof or testimony for this explanation, Mashallah Omar, Vasur. It doesn't say Vasur Mirah. There's a Vav. The Vav means and. He's going to bring other verses where it says Vasur, and it means and. And therefore, that and means and the verb of turning, like I'm doing right now, turning. Right? No. It's a concept, and he's going to prove it through other verses. I'll just read his own words. The proof to this interpretation is the fact that the verse does not say this sur with a vav, which would mean and turning from evil, but rather it says sur, which means to turn from evil. 
Um, there is a comment here, and I think we might as well read it. It's number nine. If the verse would have said, Yiras Hashem, right, and the fear of God, and turning from evil. If it would have had the Vav, so then the verse would have meant that sin is forgiven through attaining fear of God and then actually turning away from evil when confronted with it. If that were so, a person would never be able to reach the ultimate level of tshuva unless he actually was tested in the same circumstances as the original sin and withstood the test. But the truth is, the verse doesn't have the vav. It says, Yiras Hashem surmira. The fear of Hashem turns you away. It already gives you all the power to be moved away from evil. But even if it doesn't come to you. Thus it means, and through fear of Hashem, to turn from evil without the vav is the root form of turning, and in this context means to turn. According to the verse teaches that sin is forgiven when one acquires enough fear of Hashem to potentially turn from evil if ever confronted with it. I hope this is clear, at least the concept, right? The Hebrew may be difficult to understand the nuances. <coughs> I, I'm with you on that. So let's continue. He brings two more verses. In Psalms 34, 15, it says, Shun evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So, sur meira ve'asetov. So, you see that turn from evil and do good. As well as in Job 1, 8, it's just the last, which words? It's just the last few words of this verse. Now the Lord said to the adversary, to the Satan, Have you paid attention to my servant Job? For there's none like him on earth, a sincere and upright man, God-fearing and shunning evil. It's Yir Elohim, this Sar Meira, with the Vav. So here you have another case where you have the Vav. In both those cases, Psalms 34, 15, and Job chapter 1, verse 8. So in Yano Shiyasur Min Hara Bizdamin Liyado. The whole idea he wants to get across to us, let's say in those verses, those ver those two verses, is expressed is to turn from evil when confronted with it. But not in that first verse that we said in Mishlei sixteen six. Right. Um Kilo Yomru and Mur Sur Min Hamase Bilti La Asher. Yikrav la soto. One would never say, turn away from this action, except to someone who's about to do it. You don't say, don't do it, unless it's right in your hands to do it. Similarly, when our verse says that sin is forgiven through enough fear of God to turn from evil, it means the sin is forgiven through enough fear of Hashem I just, I just repeated something. One second. It means the sin is forgiven through enough fear of Hashem to turn from evil when one is confronted with it. The verse teaches that a person's sin is completely forgiven when he reaches that level at which Hashem knows that if he ever was faced with the most intense temptation, he would turn away from it. If God knows that, that means you're forgiven already. And then we have this Gemara that I mentioned already, Amra Zichron Levracha, it says, actually, this is a different, it's a Medrash, different Gemara, sorry. Yoshev Lo Avar Veira, Noshtim Lo Scharb Kaoise Mitzvah. That if one sits and does nothing, he refrains from committing a sin. In heaven, they reward him as if he did a mitzvah. Does that make any sense? Am I getting the mitzvah for not murdering anybody right now? I don't think so. Do I have a desire to murder anybody right now? No. So why would I get reward in heaven? Every, I, my whole life, right? I'm going to die at 120 someday. And I could, I could turn God, hey, you know, I count all the minutes, all the days, my waking hours. I should get, I don't know, a skyscraper full of reward for all the, the mitzvahs that I didn't, you know, I didn't violate. Like, you know, murder. <laughs> I didn't murder anybody. No, it doesn't work like that. 
So what does it mean? If one sits and refrains com from committing a sin in heaven, they reward him like one who actively performs a mitzvah. Kagon, yado menu. It has to refer to a case where one is confronted with the temptation to sin, and he, by using the fear of God, the awe of Hashem, you overcame the temptation and you were saved from it. And that is going to be the bottom line. Now, with that, here we go. So for those who came on late, I don't know, everyone's here already. Um, here is the famous story. I, I just was, I told you this is a little bit rated X. It's a little bit. I'm going to do my best to keep it clean. Now what I did was, it took me hours. <laughs> it's pages. I translated about four-fifths of it. So I'm going to just read, I think I should just, just for time's sake, I'll stop and take breaths and explain. But it's, I'll try to tell it in a story because it really is. And I'm not a good storyteller, but I'll do my damnedest. Okay? I'll start reading in English. At some point, I'm going to change over to the Hebrew because the latter part, I didn't, uh, I didn't write down. But I, I, I have clarity, I think. I read it a few times. So, as the Ben Ishchai in Ben, ben Yehoyada, he always begins with the help of God, I will explain. And I think that's very humbling, right? It seems to me, with the help of Hashem, Hashem, that there's a highest level of repentance. And that is to be able to transform your intentional sins into actual mitzvahs. Now, that is a crazy idea, but that's what we learn. If you do tshuva out of love so when you god forbid did intentional sins they're not wiped clean it's better than being wiped clean if you do tshuva out of love your intentional sins become positives mitzvahs unbelievable right if you do tshuva out of awe fear i'm um, not awe fear a lower level of fear not love guess what so your intentional sins become like accidental sins they, they become wiped clean, which is not so bad, right? We're all happy with that. But he wants to describe the difference between the highest level and the lower level. So he says the highest level is to be able to transform the intentional sins into actual mitzvahs, in which a man becomes the master. He's trying to talk about this word. What's a Baal Teshuvah? We said a Baal is a master. It also means husband. And he's going to use both ideas. He's just describing what a, a Baal Teshuvah is first before we get into the story. And therefore, the repentance, when we talk about tshuva, that's the woman. Right? There's a Baal, which is the husband. Baal to tshuva. The woman is the tshuva. Why? Because she gives birth. Now, I want to skip to one, one idea. In, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, that verse says, and these are the generations of Noach. Noach, right? Right away it says Noah. What do we need to know? What are the toldos? Toldos means the generations. These are his children? No. The generations of Noah are his masim tovim, are his actions, are the produce, what he produces. Right? Yes, your children are your produce, but your actions is what your produce and therefore, who, the woman is the one that gives forth the children. The woman, it's just a, let's call it the feminine aspect, right? The masculine part is the Baal, is the owner. But the woman, she is the one who gives birth. And she gives birth to new merits. Just as the man gives birth to children from his wife, so too these merits are called children. Just as the rabbi has explained, you can look at Rashi there in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, that it's talking about when it says, Noah walked with God, it means, it means, who are, who are the toldos? It's his actions. Okay, so what does it mean? That the toldos of the righteous are their mitzvahs and good deeds. Which is not the case for the lower level of truth. That's all on the highest level. What about the lower level of repentance? That only transforms intentional sins into unintentional sins. In such a case, he doesn't merit to have children. There are no great deeds and, and actions that he produced. Therefore, he's not a Baal Teshuvah. A Baal Teshuvah is one who's, who makes a name for themselves as a master of repentance, because that's what it means. 
So he's not considered, if he doesn't achieve that highest level, he's not a master. So we understand from the question, how does one become a Baal Tshuva? Remember, it, the question was in the Gemara, how does one attain this level? So we went through, if you're in the same place, with the same woman, the same desires, all the variables are the same. Because the Baal, or basically, how does one become, let's say, a husband? How does somebody become this master of repentance? So we already explained, the Baal is one on the highest level, and he's able to transform his intentional sins into actual merits or deeds or toldos. Only then can he be called or be classified as her husband, meaning tshuva, be married to the concept of tshuva. And the next paragraph, or perhaps we can explain, in other words, uh, an, an alternative explanation, when the question, the Gemara says, Hey, dami bal tshuva, what is the situation? How do we know? How does someone know they're a master of repentance? So in Gemara Brachas, it says, Where a master of repentance stands, a completely righteous person is not able to stand. And I already mentioned, what, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? It means that you're on such a great level that he can't stand in your shoes? <coughs> I did explain already, according to the clear car, he's saying that this Baal Tshuva can actually go places and do things that a, right, a completely righteous person cannot. Okay, let's put that aside. He says, then the repentance is related to him, and he's called the master of repentance. In other words, the, the master of repentance stands where the completely righteous person cannot Therefore, it's, it's miyaches, somehow it's related to him, and he would be like, like the husband of repentance. There's a closeness. Okay, put that aside. There's still to ask, what is the meaning of the phrase? Rav Yehuda, Rav Yehuda demonstrated what he meant, if with the same woman, at the same time, the same place. So the Ben, ben, ben Yehuda asked, what is this word, mechaze, to she showed, he demonstrated you go to a rabbi, he tells you. What did he do? He took his three fingers and he counted. He said three ways, right? The same woman, the same place, the same time, same desire, right? That, that's, that's what he meant by showing him with his fingers? So he says, it seems to me that this was the question posed in the Beit Midrash. This is what we do in the Beit Midrash. We ask all kinds of questions. Rav Yehuda did not respond with the words. This is according to the Ben Ishchai. He didn't say the same woman, same time, same place. But he actually gave a demonstration. <laughs> he gave an example. But this story I'm about to tell you, that's what he did. It, within the story, you're going to hear how it was with the same woman, the same place, same time, same variables. But this is how the Ben Ishkai, this is what you do. You go and you ask questions, and your rabbi is going to answer you. So he said about a story, a particular Baal Tshuva, right? This person has already had the title, the label of a Baal Tshuva, who lived in the south or southeast, in which he expressed as an example of Tshuva of a particular person. The person is never named to the story. But it turns out very good. Okay, he's a Baal Tshuva. And this person committed, the rabbis were aware of the repentance of this particular person, of a sin that was committed with the same woman, the same time, and the same place. Alternatively, Rav Yehuda responded explicitly with words that demonstrated with his three fingers, the outer finger, the middle finger, and the inner finger, by three distinct parts they were used to explain makom, isha, and perik, which are the Hebrew words for place, woman, and time, to push off powers of impurity that detach themselves to these three parts. We're not going to go into the Kabbalistic explanation right there, but here will come the story in a few sentences. Sorry. According to the words of Yehuda, we require these three parts. You know, I'm going to skip that. Let's go right down into the story. I will now write an amazing story to fill the words of Chazal regarding a particular single student, a Bechor, who was always trying to learn Torah. He was full of the awe of Hashem. He learned in the yeshiva before 
uh, a great Rav. Now, we're going to talk about this great Rav a lot. So, he had a great rabbi, and he learned in front of him. And this rabbi was wise and uh, a man of great action. Now, this student never stopped learning, he, even for a single day. And he was always early in the Beit Midrash and late to, late to go home. He never stopped learning for even one day. However, there was one day that this student knew that his rabbi wasn't coming for whatever reason. Maybe he had to go uh, out of town for a business meeting, whatever it was. <laughs> he, the student knew the rabbi was not coming that day to the yeshiva. So he went on a tiyul. A tiyul is like a little day trip to the forest. And he entered the most amazing large orchard, a great orchard, in order to mitayel, in order to go and walk about. In the middle of the orchard, there was a large spring. And he describes in detail, 10 cubits by 10 cubits and 20 cubits deep, surrounded by beautiful trees. There were all types of beautiful fragrances and herbs growing there. And by the edge of the, edge of the um, there was like a shed, a cabana, a little bit of a, um, like a little private area that you could get changed, showered by the spring. People could sit there, they can bathe, and they can relax. And so I already mentioned you had the spring, you had the cabana. I mean, everything was set. The Garden of Eden was in front of you, right? The student was looking. He was good. He was actually very good looking and very quite handsome. So after he sat by the cabana, you know what a cabana is, like a shed, which was by the side of the spring in order to have a rest, a, a, a woman who happened to be a non-Jewish prostitute appeared. From now on, we're just going to say a Zona, uh, who was also very good looking and beautiful, who also decided to go on a tiyul through this orchard. Um, she saw him through the trees, and she desired him, and she approached him, she acted in certain uh, seductive ways until the Eight Sahara entered him and he lay with her in the shed, which is by the edge of this spring. They performed this act. Immediately, there was a great feeling of regret. You can imagine, this is the Yeshiva Bacher, right? He got up and experienced tremendous confusion and he ran home. He returned home. He couldn't eat. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't function. He couldn't eat or sleep. Um, he couldn't eat um, the whole day. He couldn't sleep the whole night. He cried and he mourned over the action that he had performed. He consulted his heart about what to do. How am I going to fix this? How am I going to rectify this situation? Now he was quite wise, so he opened the holy book. Right? That's what you do. That speaks about how to rectify such sins. So he found there a tikkun, a way to fix his sin, by X amount of days of fasting. And there were other things to do, other afflictions one could do on themselves. But it never dimmed down on his mind. In other words, it was still percolating in his mind all the possibilities and programs for remedy for the issue that he found in these books. In the end, he concluded the way to complete his tikkun he would walk the very next morning out to the place that he originally laid with the Zona, and he would say the Kriya Shema. He would rece recite Shema Yisrael, Shem Elokeinu Shem Echad, and then he would throw himself into the deep end of the pool, and he would die there, and he would fall in, and nobody would see him, and it would be impossible for him to come up. He concluded in his mind this was the only way that he could atone for his sin, and therefore complete his tikkun for his soul. Now this idea then dimmed, it went down from his mind, and he sought and anticipated the light of day to go there and to do something that will bring his soul great joy and satisfaction to his heart. He needed a little bit of a break from his depression, I guess. So this is what he did. He went right after morning prayers in the morning with such joy and passion back to the orchard. He stood by the same shed, the cabana, by the edge of the spring, in the exact same place that he lay with the zona, the day before, he began to say the Shema in order to draw and pull and enter him to himself. And then all of a sudden, that Zona from the day before appeared. She had come as well to make a Tiyul to the very place, the same orchard, 
where she had appeared to him right after he finished Shema, when he reached the point that he was just about to throw himself into the pool, into the spring. And she came from behind him, and she hugged him, and she kissed him, and she said, I felt in my heart that you were now coming to the orchard, and I wanted to come and make love to you like we did yesterday. The student was completely baffled. I'm like, what am I doing? What, what's going on here? And he was greatly pained over what had occurred before him. He hadn't completely considered what to do now. What am I going to do? Because he said, if I'm going to throw myself in, he wasn't able to do that. If he fell in, she would, this is what he said, I, he went, like, played through his mind. If I threw myself in, she's going to scream, and then like professional lifeguards are going to come out of nowhere, and they're going to save me, and then uh, it's going to ruin everything. I want to die, right? I don't want to be saved. She'll scream, what am I supposed to do? So he felt by force to, to Mamish leave this orchard, and he would leave it, right, till the next day, when he would get, um, maybe he would go. He would he would come earlier the next day while it's still dark. In other words, his whole plan got ruined because she appeared. So maybe if I come earlier, before it even gets light out, she won't be here, and I'll be able to kill myself. But the zona was still holding him, saying, "Don't leave me." He said, "I can't do anything now." And this was a great great line. I can't do anything now that I'm in a rush to get home where I'm under pressure to deal with a very pressing matter. She swears by the life of her father that she will not leave him until he lies with her again today, just like she, he did the day before. And he sees the boldness of her face that no words he can come up with will appease her. She again attempts to seduce him, to seduce his heart, to draw him close. Meanwhile, he broke the embrace with a lot of strength, he ran, he fled away, he didn't want to lie with her or to be with her, and he left the orchard. But he didn't go home, he couldn't eat anything. Instead, now this is a little confusing because of the way I read it, it says he went to the yeshiva, but later we'll see that he wasn't at the yeshiva. But anyway, it says instead he went to the yeshiva and he concluded in his mind what his original plan was. And that's to get up early and go to the orchard before sunrise, but it pained him greatly that he needed to wait so long. I mean, he really wanted to do this tshuva properly. And I have to wait till tomorrow morning, like before the sun rises. So again, uh, he, he, he didn't know what to do with himself. Now, it says, in the meanwhile, several hours passed by, and the Rosh Yeshiva started teaching students that day. So apparently he's not in the Yeshiva, because you will see the, the Rosh Yeshiva sends his um, assistant to find him at home. But anyway, after the Rav started the lesson with the students, while he was sitting with the Talmud in his hands, the, 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 the rabbi started drifting off. Now, I don't know. I've been in classes. I have been. Where the rabbi's giving a class, and his head goes down, and nobody wants to interrupt the rabbi. You know, rabbis don't sleep much. And... Um, what can I tell you? I don't think it's ever happened to me, but I, you know, if it did, I, my students wouldn't tell me, right? So it could be. But this rabbi had a dream. So you know what I love about Hasidic stories? And this is, this is a smarty story, but a story within a story. They're the best. So we've already gotten this story. Now this rabbi's teaching the class, and his head drops, and he's in the middle of a dream. And we're now going to hear what his dream was. Amazing. So... He started to drift off and had a dream. And the dream is amazing. He was standing by a very large and great palace. He saw from a distance this particular student in a valley near a spring. And came out of the spring a long snake, four, uh, four almost, four cubits long. The whole width of the snake was a whole cubit. And it had three heads. Three heads. The snake came close to the student to swallow the student. And the student became confused by this whole thing. Well, the Rav is looking from a distance, and he saw from the palace that the student removed a knife from a sheaf in order to kill the snake before it came too close to swallow him. He saw that when the student went to stab the snake in the belly, the knife dropped from his hand. It became loose. It was released from his hand. It fell. 
Meanwhile, he retracted, he picked up the knife, and he threw it, and then cut the big head off the snake to kill him. What came out of the snake poured forth a river of blood. The rub was in amazement with what he saw. How the knife was ending up being released from this kid's hand by the student, and then he was able to pick it up and throw it and cut off the, the head of the snake and kill the snake. He was also amazed at how small the knife, the, small, the knife was very small, and it wouldn't really be long enough to kill such a huge snake. However, he was, uh, he was this, um, he saw the student afterwards raise his eyes to the heavens in praise and thanks to Hashem Yisbarach. All this the Rav saw from a distance while in his palace, and after this the Rav woke up from his sleep. The Rav was amazed by his dream, and he didn't really know what it meant. He didn't have an explanation, but he did understand that this student was experiencing great pain, and that Hashem did perform a miracle for him, and actually saved this kid. So the Rav called his assistant, and told him to send to the home of the student a question. The question was, why didn't the student come today to the yeshiva? The assistant went to the student's home and brought the student. The student then come, came into the room of the rabbi, and he saw the rabbi standing. Now, what did the rabbi see? This is amazing. The rabbi saw this student with light surrounding his head. from above the head of the student. None of the other students saw this. The rabbi saw it. After the student, student sat in his place, the Rav asked him where he was until now, and the student told him about his tiyul, about his day, um, the day trip. The Rav said, why is this day different from any other day? You're always here. You never give up. You never negate your, your Torah learning. Why did you, you leave? He says, I demand that you tell me everything that happened to you. Because I want to tell you, I had a great dream, an amazing dream about you. But I'm not going to tell you until you tell me everything that happened to you and why you didn't come. Um, and I promise you, I won't leave anything out. Okay. So the student began to cry. And he said, I sinned. I, I sinned, as I mentioned today, You know, yesterday when you didn't come to the yeshiva, I went to walk in a particular orchard. The kach, the kach karli. And this and this happened to me. And during the night, I made a decision to fix this situation, right? And I went this morning early. I went early to the um, to the orchard to do my tikkun. But then this and this happened to me. I wasn't able to complete what I had concluded in my heart, and I left this until the following day, my mind could not rest until I made my fixing, but it was, I was pretty fix, fixated on doing it this way. And I tell you, the rabbi, I tell you all this, I told you all the details, now, quickly, I want to hear your story. Tell me the, the, the halom that you had that was so good as you promised me. So the Rav got up and kissed this student on his head. And he said to him, Lo You have no reason to cry anymore. Don't do anything bad to yourself. You had all this. You were going to drown yourself. You were going to kill yourself. You have no reason for that. None whatsoever. Like you originally thought. Because the sin is already removed from you. 
and your sin is already forgiven you. You are totally complete, um, 100% complete in your fixing for this day. Because this and this is what I saw in my dream. And he explained the dream as we understood it. Now that very thought that you thought, this is going to be the most important thing, the very thought that you thought of, to kill yourself, in order to save your soul, to fix your soul, this was actually pleasing, just the thought was pleasing to Hashem. But Hashem doesn't want you to kill yourself. God does not want the death of man, but the willingness. You know, when, when we bring carbonos, right, the Ramban held, you bring a Corbin, you're supposed to say, well, that, would, that should be me. I deserve this. And that's it. Can you imagine just the thought alone that I wouldn't, you know, give myself up to Hashem? Bito. We call it the Bito. My wife and I call it the Bito program, the Beatles the Beetle program, to negate yourself to that point. Which means like this, that the merit of the Torah that you learn and the merit of the thoughts that you thought in other words, that you came to this conclusion in your mind to give yourself over, we'll call it to death. Now, just keep in mind, when, when we talk about someone des- devoting their life to Torah, the Pasuk we learn it from is when someone dies in the tent. Meaning, we'll talk about it another time, but there's a Pasuk that talks about Tuma Tahara, purity and impurity. That a person should devote themselves to Torah that they're willing to, i.e., example, give themselves over for, to death for the sake of learning Torah. Obviously, Hashem wants us to live. But the thought alone, the willingness, that's enough. Unbelievable. So he says, that thought alone, to give yourself over on the count of fixing your soul, is actually what is protecting you and completes your tikkun. In this way, what you did today. Because it's from heaven... It's from heaven, this is what the rabbi's telling him, that heaven declared, right, the Satan is an angel of God, it woken that woman up to meet you out there. Like I said, how, how, how are you supposed to organize the same woman, the same place, all that? The guy was not interested, and yet Hashem orchestrated the whole thing for him. He got the Satan aroused within this zona, the desire to go, to the um, to the orchard, thinking she might meet him, and of course she did. He ayoma zeba boker loosu pardes, right to waken her up to go to the same to the same orchard, and the yetsahara, the evil inclination, which is that primal snake, right the nachash hakadmoni, that primal snake, which um, seduced seduced you yesterday, and tripped you up. In other words, Ukashilcha um, made you stumble with that zona. It came back and it entered her this very day. This is the Nachash, the snake, that I saw in my dream. The rabbi saw the snake in his own dream. And that's the snake that he saw. But you, Baruch Hashem, you fought this very day with your Yetzirah, which is the snake. In that very same place, with the very same peric time, ba'oto isha, meaning with the same stamina, with the same desires, with the same woman, velo but you, you, you didn't allow it to overtake you. Ella afa pi shachivka venoshka, even though she hugged you and she kissed you, and she spoke words that would draw you into um, a relationship. You overcame it, and you released from your hand. You released the situation from your hand, 
and you ran away and you abandoned it. See, then those thoughts that you originally had to give yourself over to Misa, to death, on account of this fixing of your soul, transformed, Nahafcha el Oyev, it transformed towards your enemy that you were able to kill the Nachash, the, the, the snake, which is the Yetzirahara, Ba'oto Makom, in the very same place, in the same manner, in the same woman. This is the bottom line. This is the power of thought. Just the thought alone. The rabbi is telling the student, that's the power of your thought, that it's that knife, that little knife that I saw in my dream that was released from your hand and you threw it and it, it killed, it cut off the head and killed that snake. Now, already, it's what is the mashkis, that um, destructive force is gone. It's dead. And you made biasura shaletmo, that whole act that you did yesterday that was forbidden, you transformed it, you turned the avera, which was called a sin, into a great merit. Remember when this young student walked into the rabbi's office, his whole head was glowing with light and aura as they say if that's uh, permissible to use who can even judge you do you have any idea how much fixing you made for yourself in the garden of eden meaning for all eternity on account of this thing and as a proof for this he says Amut shall ur asheriiti ota this um this light that's around you that I see now zakuf lamalim nirushka that somehow goes around your whole head that you have to understand my falling asleep remember that was like for him maybe he never fell asleep so he felt this was from heaven it was from heaven that caused me to have this drowsiness that I fell asleep um. And that, um, in other words, I fell asleep not in the right time. It wasn't like, you know, two in the morning. It was the three in the afternoon. In order for me to see this dream, to tell you not to cause yourself any more damage. You, the, the thought alone, that's it. You, you're, you're forgiven. Kisur Avoncha, right? As the verse said in, and it was Mishli 16.6, that you're... Your sin has been forgiven, um, removed from you. Vinishlam tiku nafshecha, so you're 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 fixed. And not only that, ashrecha the ashrecha kecha. How fortunate are you? How great is your portion? The yismachatalma and the student was so happy with the words from his rabbi. Vamin biatzmo, he now believed in himself. Shenatakein avono, that his sins were fixed. adkan, and that Hashem accepted and was appeased by his tshuva. And now from this, this is the conclusion of the Ben Ishchai, from this you would understand the words of the rabbis, right? When, they, when Rav Yehuda says, I'm going to demonstrate to you, right? The Mechavi, Eiz of Balchuva, because that was the original question. How do we know who's about Chuva? And, and, you know, he says, I'm going to demonstrate to you. And he just says the same woman, the same place, same time. The the Benish Kai doesn't believe that was really what was said. There was a, it had to be a whole story. And Perak Isha Tamid and And that is what happened. So I hope this brings a lot of joy to people who know that we don't kill ourselves. We don't it's it's not it's not beneficial. There is a point where one should feel they're willing to give their entire life over to God. Even when we say the Shema, every time we say the Shema, right, right, Rebbe Akiva gave up his life for the love of God. So we should imagine ourselves, I mean, I imagine a, a, a Jordanian tank 
staring down a Jordanian tank. You know what I mean? Like, it can go off at any second when I say the Shema, right? We're talking about something more than that. We're talking about, obviously, when per people sin. But nevertheless, we have to learn how to give our lives over to Hashem. So, with, with, hopefully this message is clear. Um, we don't, this, any kind of, um, you know, depression and affliction is not, it's not going to be helpful. And you can see just the, a, a second of a thought was enough. Okay? And such siyata de shmaya, such a tremendous assistant from Hashem. He's there for you. He, like we spoke about, he carries you, right? The, 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 the footprints in the sand, right? He carries you. And we think, oh my God, I'm all alone. No, that's specifically when he carries you. So this is an amazing story. When I when I started reading, I was like, "Oh my God, when's it going to end?" Because I, I got like I, I I think I spent like three or four hours translating this, and I I didn't even like prepare the rest of this year. But I had gone through it before uh, uh, earlier today. But um, I usually try to go through it much more. So this um, this was a good story. It was a good story. I hope it was not too uh, what do you call it? BYS right below yeshiva standards. But we kept it clean. And we're all adults, and you can apply it to any sin, right? It, it's just this is a standard uh, example, right? It's um, maybe too easy for certain people to relate to, and maybe some people can't relate at all. So, Bizrat Hashem, we will be back, right? Misha Niknas Adar, Marbi Besimcha. So that's what we're here to do. We're getting ready for all the miracles. We're looking forward to them <clears throat> on a daily basis. Right. on a personal basis, on a national basis, coming towards Nisan, but we have yet to overcome Hamalek and Bezrat Hashem will give us strength to overcome our Yetzirah on the internal enemy and the external enemy as well. And with that, I will now take questions. So I'm going to say, have a great life to all you in Cyberland, and I'm going to give some attention to the people who so patiently waited for me to turn off the camera. <laughs>